everyone. My name is Eran, Eran Rothman, and welcome to Quantum Tech for Healthcare Meetup. Uh, for the ones who doesn't know, this initiative was founded in order to accelerate the use cases discussion uh, for quantum technologies across different branches of healthcare and life sciences. Uh, it's, it's aimed to be a platform for new collaboration. So what we are aiming to do is roughly every month we will be covering another segment, try to identify a leading player um, with each field. So they would be able to share with us their stories and, and do the best effort to, uh, to gather healthcare and life science, life scientists, uh, professionals who could both benefit from it and also contribute to this discussion. Uh, on today's session, we are going to address one of the hottest topics right now in quantum computing, uh, where we think it's going to, going to make a huge impact, which is drug discovery and design. Each of our panelists today has a goal in front of them. It's either to find a vaccine or to reduce drugs, uh, uh, drug side effects, uh, to build hardware or software platforms that will actually get us a step closer towards tailored medicine. So a little bit of housekeeping before we start our session today, as you all know the drills, I would like to ask you to, to double check that you are on mute before we start to avoid any background noises during this session. We will have a Q&A session at the end. Uh, in case you would like to submit questions, please use the chat next to you so we can address your questions accordingly. Uh, in, in case of any technical issues that you cannot solve by log out and log in again to this session, uh, don't worry, we will have a recorded uh, session that we will be available in a few days time in one of uh, Quantum Tech for Healthcare channels, either on Meetup, LinkedIn, or YouTube, okay? Uh, we are going to have a great panel of experts today. This panel will be moderated by Dr. Dave Snelling. An AI program director at Fujitsu's uh, CTO office, they have a track record of th both theoretical and practical background in computer science. And I think we'll just hand it over to Dave. Hey, thank you, folks. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a really enjoyable session today. We're going to have a, a set of four speakers who are going to talk for about 10 minutes each. Um, we're going to be very strict on timing, so the, we'll, we will mute them. So if you see them suddenly go silent, it just means they, they ran out of time. And then we will have questions at the end. Now we have, of course, we have some pre-canned questions, but it'd be much more interesting to get questions from the audience. So if you would use your chat capability on Zoom to put in um, who you would like to ask the question of, uh, which of the speakers initially, although all the speakers would have the option to answer any of the questions. Uh, and then we will pick them up as we go through um, the question and answer period at the end. If you all aren't interested in asking questions, then I will ask some questions or Aaron will ask some questions. But um, this is participatory. We want to know what you think. And so let's, let's go ahead and get started. I believe the first person on the agenda, well, who was going first on this one? I can't remember now. Is it, is it, uh, uh, is it Hans first? So we have Shachal and Nihil. Okay. Does any of you are ready to start? I can start. Okay, sure. And you have slides to share, I take it? Uh, yes. Um, let me see if I can... You should be able to just do it normally yourself. Uh, I can't share my slides. So, um, Hans, you, Aaron, you probably need to enable that for the hosts. Mm, yeah, thanks, Aaron. Good. Meanwhile, I'll probably do that for the other speakers as well. Do you guys see my screen? Yep. Yes. Please put it into presentation mode at some point. So. Perfect. Okay. So, Iran, you can start now counting the time, of course. Um, 
So my name is Shahar Kinan. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Polar Polaris Quantum Biotech. We are uh, part of the quantum revolution in drug discovery. And what we're interested in is in a rapid drug discovery in vast chemical space. When I talk about vast, I really mean vast. So 10 billions of molecules. And this is powered by quantum inspired technology. So who we are, we were founded this year. So six, we are six months old, quite new but we made a lot of progress in those six months. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders and Bill Shipman, uh, Polaris CTO, uh, is the other founder, co-founder. We were started in Durham, North Carolina, and we are collaborating with the Fujitsu, Fujitsu G Digital Miller, and this is the Lon their London-based team, to develop molecular leads, so small molecules, for protein targets of interest, and we're doing it in two months time frame. Traditional drug discovery is lengthy and expensive. We're doing it 10 times faster by using the power of quantum computers. Um, we think of it right now as a four months because after two months of computational discovery, there is another two months of experimental verification. But this is something that before used to take, again, three years. We're using Fujitsu Digital Miller, um, which is a quantum inspired technology. This is not a fully quantum technology. It is based on silicon, but it mimics the power, the power and the capabilities of quantum computing for some questions. And these are the questions that we are asking. What we are looking for is again, optimization problems finding the best molecule in very large chemical space. This is something that the digital annealer can do like that, very fast, very efficient, looking at billions of molecules. There is no other technology that can do this right now. And this is solving real world challenges today. We start from a target protein, which is the cause of the disease, example, COVID-19. For COVID-19, you've probably heard a lot about the spike protein or other proteins that are needed for that specific virus to work. If we stop the activity of these proteins, we will stop the virus progression. So we start from a protein, we identify the binding pocket, where in that protein we can put something that will stop the activity of that protein. And then we say, okay, inside that pocket, if we think of it as a glove, what kind of a hand we can put inside that pocket? Now let's look at all possible chemistry that can fit into that specific pocket. We built a library that is billions of molecules. We have a proof of concept with Fujitsu where we looked at 1 billion molecules. Since then, we looked at 10 million, sorry, at 10 times more than that. So over 10 billion molecules. We use the digital annealer to find the best molecules in there. We use some other tools afterwards. And at the end of it, we have a set of molecules that we can now go and test and try for a molecular drug, a molecular medicine. We're using both the digital annealer for the quantum computer part, and we are using machine learning and QMMM, which is a quantum chemistry tool to find the best molecules in there. But think of this, we start from billions of molecules, the digital annealer goes to 10,000 molecules, the best 10,000 molecules in that, um, in that uh, large chemical space. And then using machine learning and QMMM, we go to 10 to 20 molecules that goes to experimental verification. Uh, one of our first example, and this is, has been published, um, looking at dengue fever, which is uh, a, a disease that still um, hit quite a lot of the, a very large part of the um, third world population. Um, and where we looked at, um, at billions of molecules and the optimization calculations. So running the 
digital annealer on that problem took under five minutes to complete. Um, and if anybody is interested, you're welcome to look at uh, this specific white paper. Um, I think that's it for me. If anybody is interested in, uh, in answering questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Dave, do you want them now or do you want to do this later? I think we'll save questions to the end. Excellent. Very okay. good. Okay, that was very quick. Um, you, you've, you've made extra time. We won't give any of that extra time to any of the other speakers. Oh. Okay, uh, we will we'll, we'll save it for in, enjoying the conversation at the end, because I'm Thanks. sure we will have plenty of questions uh, by the time we get there. So, Aaron, who do you want to go next, I think, in our sequence? Nihil, are you ready to share your presentation? Yeah, sure. Let me try. Okay. Okay, Nahil, give yourself a, a brief introduction as you start, so we all know who you are. Yeah, sure. Can you see the screen? Yep. Okay. Okay, so welcome everyone. Good evening. Um, I will give you a brief introduction about me and the company. So basically, I am Nihil Kane. I'm CTO of Epix Qubit. And um, I was kind of interested in intelligence for all my life. And I have went into artificial intelligence field when the last revolution in artificial intelligence came, like, well, eight years ago. And basically, I spent last five years doing research, um, let's say, in um, machine learning on mobile devices, ranging to reinforcement learning for optimization of neural networks, and uh, I have a kind of a mixed background in biology, mathematics, and physics because of the post-USSR education systems. And in general, I'm motivated by um, extension and existence of humanity. And that's what motivates our company and me in the long term. And that's why at Epix Qubit, we are trying to kind of uh, improve our drug discovery processes. What we are trying to do, we're trying to unlock rapid development of personalized drugs with less side effects based on hybrid quantum machine learning. Um, so basically the plan of the presentation is composed of three stages. At the first stage, I will talk a little bit about the drug design stages and some of our insights. I believe uh, something was already told about the drug discovery itself. So it will be a brief one for now. Uh, the second one will be about our classical machine learning pipeline we have already. And the third one will be about enhancement of this kind of a pipeline to use the quantum computations. So basically, there is, there is kind of a complex slide. I believe uh, it's the only complex slide in this presentation. Uh, it's taken from the BCG uh, report on usage of quantum in pharmaceutical. Um, so let me simplify this slide. The idea here is that there are three stages in the drug discovery in general. So there is a part where we work with the target and we want to understand its properties, we want to understand what is the target and where is the kind of a binding site, cavities, where to connect this target. Uh, the second stage is actually called the drug design. And at drug design, we're trying to actually design a drug. We're, we're trying to create a molecule which is efficient at attacking this target while being kind of non-toxic, stable, and all the other properties. And the third stage is actually about trials. What we want to actually get is kind of make this molecule safe for the human beings, make it uh, stable in the human organism just to figure out if it can go to the market. Uh, and what this report says is actually drug design is the first stage to be modified by quantum computations. Why is that? Well, the answer is pretty simple because, uh, well, working with the target or with clinical trials requires us to work with the complex systems of biology, meaning the whole organisms in general. And in drug design, you're working mostly only with the target and maybe some other molecules. You, could, you don't have to work with the whole organism. That's why it's easy. So talking about insights. So the first thing is smiles are overrated. So if someone doesn't know what are smiles, smiles are actually just simplified chemical formulas. And they're mostly used for drug design in pharmaceutical companies. And wh why are they not efficient? So actually we have started with some experiments on smiles based on deep DTA paper. So these guys were trying to predict binding affinity based on smiles and amino acid sequences. And the problem was actually their results were really good on some validation sets they have proposed, but 
actually we have done more rigor validation and we have discovered the results are kind of well just random guessing and it was not really better than just guessing on random and in general uh there are several problems so it's a weak validation protocols uh that's why most of the well serious concurrence on the market they're trying to use 3d models and that's what we are trying to use uh, the second question comes is that um, there, if you are using smiles, you most likely don't want to use 3D structures of proteins. Why is that? Because they're, well, pretty large and they take a lot of computational powers. And because of this, you're still using uh, amino acid sequences for proteins. And, well, the problem here is that it's really hard to combine these both languages between each other in machine learning model. That's why the model has kind of troubles to understand what is the structure of the protein, how does it interact with the molecule. It's really hard for the model to get all of this. And the third problem com comes from this one is that proteins, they actually have binding sites, we connect to them, but it's really hard to represent the binding site if you're, well, just writing a chemical formula. And you make this, um, well, kind of a probabilistical model which tries to implement this process. You want it to figure it out, and it's another kind of a, well, more complex job to do. So the second insight is about weak data culture in general in biotechnology. So, well, most of the papers, they use different, well, mixed quality data they use uh, a very vast amount of protocols or kind of variations in their representation of data. Because of this, um, you cannot really take any kind of data sets on the internet, combine them together and make a really nice model. You need a lot and a lot of data processing for it. In general, the problem is there are lots of unlabeled data, but it's really hard to label it. And for real machine learning revolution in the field, you need just millions of data samples. And it's not always available in this field because of this problem. So in general, the solution is to use industrial techniques, which are used in computer vision or maybe other developed parts of machine learning. So it's all about modification of data. I mean, data augmentation itself or fine tuning of models. So we need much more industrial approach in order to make this work. The third thing is, uh, well, quantum computations are kind of slowly scaling. Most of the papers are just solving toy scale experiments. And what we have found is that, well, there are two ways to solve this, except some other kind of ways like usage of different uh, classical computers or special chips, which emulate something on quantum. So the idea is such, uh, the first one idea is to use quantum computer as kind of a preprocessing a uh, preprocessing step for the classical algorithm just to create some approximation and work with it with the classical computers just to get a more large scale solution. The second idea is to use something like quantum neural networks, which allow us to handle some quantum dependencies in data and then use the same way, the same scale neural networks in a classical industrial machine learning. So that allows to scale the solution still using something on the quantum side and scaling as fast as uh, industry allows us to. So coming to the next stage, our machine learning pipeline is actually mostly implemented and we are aiming to sell it to pharma companies in a few months. Uh, the first stage is about folding and binding sites uh, of the protein. And the second stage is about generation of some ligands, which will connect to these proteins, and we're trying to optimize them for some characteristics. And at the third stage, we're approximating these characteristics with some kind of probabilistic models. So the idea here is such, for binding site prediction, there is a problem that we need to voxelize the data. So in general, it takes a lot of time, but it's still much faster than using the common techniques in the domain. And well, it allows in general to recognize the interaction between atoms of a molecule and the protein. And at the same time, you can classify the beans in pocket uh, type. So it can be a heme pocket, or maybe it can be ATP pocket. And it allows to kind of validate the results uh, with just manual experts. The second thing is generation of drugs. There is uh, a reference to in silica medicine paper. So what they propose is to construct chemical space with autoencoders and then induce some properties because there is some possibility just to kind of uh, shift this space in order to get some, well, easy to get properties. But if you want to optimize it to some specific protein, some targets, you need to use reinforcement learning in order to get more kind of a complex rules which are connected with the chemistry. 
And the last part is about prediction of properties. There is a reference to Deep Atom. It's one of the new papers on prediction of beans in affinity. And it's actually pretty good at predicting it, at least for some uh, family of the proteins. There is the same problem of lots of data you need to use and you need to kind of, well, process it to get voxelized. And it's still much and much faster than common methods in the industry. At the same time, you can use affinity, which is predicted by this model to optimize molecules generated at the previous step. So going to the quantum hybrid pipeline, there are three things. We actually focus only on the second one, uh, but uh, I will still mention the first one and the third. And the first one is actually based on the IBM protein folding. And uh, their solution is such. So they propose to uh, generate some kind of quantum circuits with genetic algorithm in order to get some protein folding algorithm. And they optimize it based on the existing confirmation of proteins. So basically what we propose, we propose to sample many kind of quantum folds of proteins and then add some noise by generative adversarial networks and train this GAN on the estimations of properties uh, we get from the previous models. So basically we generate uh, these proteins, we get some noisy models of these proteins, and then we try to get uh, which kind of noisy proteins are closer to the real experimental data. This is how we optimize this kind of molecular, molecular dynamics approximation. I need, second, Neil, yep, Neil, sure. I, Your one time last is, sentence for closure. So we can allow the, yeah. Yeah, just sure. Real, real quick, just finish. Yeah, sure. And basically the second stage is about uh, molecular screening. It's just re implementation of the paper of Xenadu. And what we do next is we try to optimize it not with classical algorithms, but with reinforcement learning. And the last stage is just about machine learning based on Google paper recently published, and they allow to disentangle quantum data and work with large neural networks. So basically that's it. And thank you for your time. Sorry for the long kind of dialogue. No, that's perfectly all right. You do. got there just in time. Sure. Okay, um, next up, do we have, um, uh, Frederick, are you next? Yes, uh, happy to go next. Okay. okay. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you just okay. fine. Okay, so around uh, 10 minutes, yes? Yeah, around 10 minutes, yeah. Good. Just pull up some slides. So as I'm pulling up the slides, um, let me do a quick intro. So greetings everyone from Zurich, Switzerland. My name is Frederik Flöter. I'm part of IBM's quantum industry consulting team uh, where I lead life sciences and healthcare. So next uh, 10 minutes or so, I want to give you a little bit of an outlook on the discovery of drugs as well as generally new therapies, um, what may be possible with quantum computing. I do want to highlight um, that uh, obviously this is a very early technology. So we uh, expect it to be transformative, uh, but it does take time. Um, you should be able to see my screen. Is it coming up? Okay, good. Um, so some of these applications I want to highlight, uh, it's obviously not an exhaustive list, but they are what we're exploring as part of the Q network, um, which is our ecosystem uh, covering a range of startups, uh, large Fortune 500 companies, as well as academic institutions. Um, and if we look at the industry more broadly, why is it key in life sciences to consider this next wave of, of uh, evolution of computational technology? Well, taking three figures um, as, a, as a reference point here, uh, genomic sequencing has dropped significantly in cost and accessibility over the last years. Um, we have already touched on in this session the costs and inefficiencies around bringing new molecular, small molecule entities to market. And also there's a huge explosion in terms of the health data that's being generated. So if we capture all of that and we try to see, okay, well, in life sciences, where can quantum have its impact really? 
Um, one can break it down into three areas that reinforce each other for discovering these new therapies. One is creating precision medicine therapies by better understanding how you can link genomes and outcomes. Two, which we've already heard quite a bit about, is small molecule drug discovery and how we can enhance patient outcomes with that. And three is focused, uh, again, uh, we've touched on it already, protein folding predictions and how we can then uh, get with those to novel biological products. Now, obviously these three, they are uh, very closely linked and they do reinforce each other in the discovery space in life sciences. And I just want to dig a little bit deeper into each of those in the next couple of minutes. Let's start with genomes and outcomes. Um, so currently, although our, our understanding of genomics has obviously advanced, it's still a relatively slow turnaround translating those insights from bench to bedside, as you might say. So the idea is that if we can uh, use some of those enhanced quantum machine learning models that we've already talked about to interpret and annotate those uh, genomic data sets, coupling that with de novo structure prediction, um, this will really be a foundation for all those other discovery efforts uh, that, that we are discussing here today. And uh, just as an indicator of the, of the, uh, the work that's already going on in terms of just collecting this data, around 50% of pharma and biotechnology companies are already collecting DNA samples from clinical trial participants. So just making sense of those complex correlations will be key. Secondly, let's talk about the small molecule process. Uh, we've heard it's very inefficient. Um, so far, it has been mainly a one disease, one protein, one drug paradigm. Um, and if we look at the total, what you would call the chemical space, so all the potentially pharmacologically active molecules, um, that's pretty big, it's 10 to the 60. And uh, that actually fits nicely with quantum in the sense that we often talk about those exponential quantum Hilbert spaces. Uh, so specifically, the, uh, uh, the areas that are of interest here to explore with quantum computing is increasing the fraction of the in silico discovery that we can take place, um, as well as looking at more complex drug interactions and repurposement of drugs. So for the third uh, area, I do want to quickly switch over to a very brief demo, um, if that works. Just reshare my screen. Um, and that's actually on the topic of protein folding. Um, we heard already that the previous speaker mentioned it, um, that uh, there was a paper that we put out last year which explores that in some more detail. So this is an external demo here. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be putting the link into the chat as well in case anyone wants to play with it. Uh, but it illustrates this concept when you're trying to, as you're driving towards the discovery of new biological products, you really need to understand how those proteins fold. Uh, classically, it's a very hard problem. Um, so in this demo here, you can see with a, a lattice based model, uh, you can pick one of those simpler peptides, such as a neuropeptide, and then run this, see how it folds as you decrease the energy. Um, and uh, what's behind it is, uh, as the previous speaker mentioned, there is actually a, a quantum classical algorithm behind it. So you have a classical optimization routine as well as uh, this quantum circuit in it. So, um, with all of that, uh, I will be happy to share that uh, in case people also want to do a bit more reading up in general or and what are some of those uh, promising life sciences healthcare applications uh, uh, that are worth exploring. Um, I can recommend two reports um, actually that I can share in the chat as well. Um, so with that, I do want to Say thanks uh, for listening today. I'll keep it brief so we have enough time for the discussion and pass it back again. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, Hans, you're the last one up. And uh, 
we do have a few questions coming in, so now's the time for people to put their thinking caps on. Are ready, Hans? Uh, can you guys hear me now? Yep. Give me just one second. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, while Hans is preparing his screen, I will share with you some poll. I would appreciate if you can answer it. It will help us to understand uh, more or less uh, what are you interested to hear next. Thank you for joining. <laughs> all right, can you guys hear, see my screen there now? Yep, we're all set, Hans. Okay, perfect. Let me just go ahead and go from here. All right, uh, so thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for the invite as well. So my name is Hans Mella. I'm one of the co-founders at Maintain AI. Uh, so I'm just gonna very briefly introduce what we do at the company. Um, we uh, essentially design peptides uh, using a combination of um, methods, including machine learning and quantum computing. Um, and um, just to introduce the, the, the problem, and maybe I'm just building off on some of the problem uh, that people already talked about, uh, but when it comes to designing uh, proteins generally and peptides are, a, you know, a small protein, um, you have basically uh, a couple of options. Uh, the first option is really simple. If you're interested in, uh, you know, finding a, a peptide uh, for a particular purpose, say, uh, for, as an antiviral for COVID-19, for example. Um, it is very unlikely that such a natural peptide will exist in nature. Uh, but if you're lucky enough, you can go to nature and maybe you can try to find it, right? Uh, now the problem there is that there is a really small, uh, actually pool of options available to you. Uh, then you can expand some, uh, the library of possibilities using techniques like phase display, directed evolution, and that'll get you a little bit further. Uh, but the real problem is that the actual space of possibilities is billions of orders of magnitude larger than that. Uh, in fact, uh, a single um, hundred amino acid uh, protein that has more possible sequences than there are atoms in the universe. Uh, so it's just a kind of problem where it's really in intractable. Uh, and it's intractable in many ways. And if we try to do this in the lab, of course, we wouldn't have time. Uh, but if we try to do this on a computer, uh, we just don't have the capacity uh, to do that many computations. Um, and so we really are sort of looking for a new type of technology uh, to be able to, to kind of tap into this uh, space over here. And so, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the effort at Maintain AI um, uh, is in that direction. We are been already developing uh, computational methods for designing uh, proteins uh, for many years, where uh, people, a group of people, um, <clears throat> including developers of some um, open source and, and, and closed source, I guess, uh, protein design software. And so we're kind of building on some of those uh, limitations. Um, as some of the colleagues already said, uh, the first kind of low hanging fruit, if there's such a thing in quantum, uh, it's really optimization, right? Uh, so we've been focusing on some optimization use cases uh, for designing proteins. And so to give you a, a, a sense of that, I'll just briefly give you a couple of examples. Uh, so some, some, this is some of the work uh, done by some of the, uh, together with some of the uh, members of the community uh, by Menten, uh, including members of Menten AI's team. Uh, and here's their examples of peptides uh, created completely from scratch, de novo, uh, including non-natural amino acids meaning we're extending uh, the building blocks that nature normally uses in multinational amino acids. And so these are examples uh, that have already been developed. Um, and so <clears throat> using quantum, we're trying to uh, go beyond some of the, those limitations. Uh, we would like to uh, be able 
to explore the entire uh, sequence space using uh, better techniques. And so we actually developed uh, a number of algorithms uh, at, at Menten in order to, to be able to do this. Um, now the algorithms uh, themselves uh, essentially map the, the protein design uh, problem to a quantum formulation that then can be mapped onto uh, quantum inspire or quantum uh, hardware. And we've done this in, in a few different ways. Here is a simple uh, example uh, where we've done this for, for D-Wave. Uh, and I won't go into details, but happy to chat more about that. Uh, and just uh, here are some examples of um, uh, peptide uh, design with quantum uh, in, in the loop. In this case, we used uh, the D-Wave machine. Uh, and we, we des designed these peptides, uh, which are actually uh, pretty um, special in the, in the sense that they use non-natural amino acids, completely new backbones, uh, and so there is really new biology uh, uh, using new methods. All right, uh, so we are building on these methods, uh, including some uh, applications. Here are just an example of uh, what we're interested in is not just designing uh, software or predictions, but we of course want to make sure that uh, the predictions actually match the results, or the result match the predictions. Uh, and so here is a couple of examples uh, where if, if you can see uh, the lighter shade of both um, uh, blue and, and brown here, uh, is the prediction superimposed with the, design, with the actual wet lab result. Uh, and and we get a sub Armstrong, sub one Armstrong RMSD. So essentially, we get in uh, almost perfect uh, matching between the designs created uh, on, on, on using this quantum method and actual wet lab results. Uh, and we've been expanding these methods um, for specific peptide therapeutics um, in, in the pipeline. All right. Um, so. Just a quick teaser there. I uh, want to thank uh, a lot of people uh, from the Rosetta community, uh, some partners uh, that we have uh, at, at Brigetti and D-Wave, uh, and of course the, the Menton team. So thank you. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. So let's see, we're ready for some um, question time here. And I want to look at the chats. Now, I've, I've got a few of these already highlighted that I can bring up to people's attention. So the first question, I think, is to you, Shahar. Um, how drug-like are the molecules in the starting library of the 10 billion? How good are they as starting points for hit optimization? So you're, it, it's a question about your starting library. So the library that we use is um, quite drug-like. So we make sure this is small organic molecules. Uh, we make sure that they are reasonable. The chemistry is reasonable. Uh, when I'm talking about reasonable, I mean that um, they would be something that would not scare a medicinal chemist or organic chemist. Um, the, both the molecular weight is um, below 800. The number of hydrogen bond donors, number of hydrogen bond acceptors in the library is uh, what you would think of is in the rule of five. So these are organic molecules, small organic molecules that are drug-like. Some of the, of course, afterwards, when we, we remove molecules that are not just drug-like, we add more, uh, more properties that would make them better drugs. But we start from a library of drug-like molecules. Okay. Um, another one for you, Shahar. Um, what protein did you look at for COVID-19? Do you start? Do you know the starting point for your protein, or do you have to sort of look and go go hunting for it with the? And what criteria do you use to go looking for the protein for the protein target? So I cannot talk about the protein target for COVID-19. I'm sorry, but I can tell you what the criteria are. So we are looking for a protein that has been shown to be relevant for the disease. So a protein that we know when blocking that specific protein, the activity of that protein will influence the disease progression. We're also looking for a protein where there's a binding pocket. 
that we can target and that where we know the 3D structure of the protein and of the binding pocket. Um, so we are disease agnostic. We can work with whichever disease, but we need to know the structure of the protein and the binding pocket. Okay. And the next question is a little more general, and I think anybody, any of the four <coughs> who would like to just please go ahead and answer. Is it possible to conduct virtual screening of catalytic nanoparticles to discover the most sensitive, i.e. having the highest probability of breaking some crosslinks in ECM by using quantum computing technology? Um, and hands up to everybody who understood the question, you get bonus points, because I didn't. So, <laughs> so any, any other, anybody want to answer that one? Any of the four of our um, speakers? I can try to give uh, some short answer. I'm not an expert on nanoparticles anyway, uh, but still the problem seems kind of uh, similar to predicting, let's say, binding affinity. So in terms of machine learning, at least. And basically, um, it depends on the data we actually possess. If we have some data on such particles, which actually, well, certainly break the ECM, and uh, these data sets are kind of large, like 100K data points or larger, then potentially it's possible to approximate with machine learning. Otherwise, it might be hard to do this with such algorithms. Yeah, so I, I think that the data sets, they are much smaller on Hill, um, but I think the power of quantum chemistry might be good here. Um, and I think IBM has looked uh, at some of those kind of problems. Um, maybe the collaboration they have here with um, North Carolina State University. Um, but Frederick can probably tell us more about that. So I'm happy to, to comment on that as well. Um, so the short answer is yes, it is possible uh, to simulate catalytic reactions on a quantum computer. Uh, the, the long answer is it's, it's a very hard problem. Uh, it requires quantum chemistry, uh, especially for that type of large molecule. We're really quite far still uh, for using, uh, from doing that on, on quantum computers today. Uh, but certainly it, it is the kind of problem that is extremely well suited uh, for quantum technology. Uh, it, it is not a low hanging fruit. It's not a simple optimization problem, uh, but certainly the kind of problem that, you know, uh, quantum computer will be able to help with. I would add the idea here that, so I, I totally agree that we need to use quantum chemistry here, otherwise problem is way too far for us. But um, for quantum chemistry, as far as I know, IBM have reached only results for really small molecules, not like in biochemistry uh, for pharma companies. I mean, really small molecules of a few atoms. Otherwise, quantum chemistry is not really approximatable yet on quantum computers, meaning that with this approach, we're kind of, well, a lot of far behind. So, Frederick, did you want to add anything to that, that, that question? Well, uh, what I want to add on that notion of, you know, how, how close to, to driving real business and scientific impact is it, um, I think that comment is obviously, it, it applies to all the applications, but we haven't yet reached that point of, of quantum advantage where uh, we really have that advantage. However, I would argue um, that some of the chemistry applications uh, yes, uh, you know the sorts of um, the sorts of sizes we're working with. We've seen uh, with the proteins and also the molecules. Uh, they are they are not yet in a regime where they are really uh, of of great value. However, uh, it does lend itself naturally to quantum computing uh, as a whole. Um, you know, Feynman this was also his original take on it. Uh, if, if, if it's a natural quantum mechanical process, then you should be using quantum computers for it. So I would say that uh, perhaps, you know, once, once we reach that quantum advantage phase, uh, you may see some of those chemistry applications actually being some of the earlier ones. Uh, but of course, no one knows for sure. Yeah. So while you, while you have the microphone, Frederick, um, the, there was a question that you answered in the chat about the number of amino acids that the framework can handle today. Go ahead and answer that one verbally so everybody gets the benefit of it. Absolutely, so yeah, so the question was uh, on the protein folding. So we've, we've talked about that a number of times today and I was showing this demo based on the uh, paper we released last year uh, where we showed how we can take 
uh, one of those quantum algorithms and adapt it to the case of uh, lattice model proteins. And the question specifically was around, well, what sort of sizes um, can be uh, uh, tested uh, with the quantum computers uh, of those peptides. Um, and specifically, two types of peptides were studied. One was uh, the smaller one was uh, seven amino acids, neuropeptide. And then the larger one, uh, so the largest one that we've published there was 10 amino acids, angiotensin. Um, now, once again, uh, obviously this is uh, not yet a regime where it's uh, driving huge value, and that we understand that folding, but the value there is having, knowing how to map this kind of problem to the quantum computer um, and having this quantum algorithm that scales much more favorably. So in this case, if you look at uh, how the Hamiltonian scales, uh, it, it's, it's much more favorable scaling than you would expect with classical approaches. And that's the real value then. Uh, the, the, everything improves, especially the hardware and the quantum volume, that then you can get those benefits in years to come. Excellent. So this is a general question, I think, was to, to most everybody. And that about the data related to molecules are, are the data we see generated uh, computationally or experimentally? Uh, I guess it's at the end of the the final analysis stage. From my point of view, uh, in our case, we're getting data about molecules from data sets and they're experimentally obtained, but potentially we can generate it uh, with, well, very nice preciseness on a quantum computers, but I believe it's, well, it will be there in a few years for larger molecules which are used in pharma companies. Okay, anyone else want to touch that one or? Okay, that's fine. Now, the, the next question is at uh, Nahil, which says the problem among those presented where is the Apex qubit specifically looking at what quantum computing hardware? The links on the slides are from Xanadu Protein, Cure, um, and IBM. So, sure. Nahil, what's your quantum hardware target? Yeah, so for now, our primary goal is to do a, a reverse molecular screening. So we want to take a few molecules, few drugs, and repurpose them for uh, new targets. And uh, basically, we need to screen them against these targets. And uh, so we focus on uh, Xenadu's experiment on calcium boson sampling. Um, they were doing it on Xenadu computer and with protein cure. So basically what we want to do, we want to modify it with reinforcement learning in order to optimize small scale graphs it produces because they are not industrially usable. So basically we currently focus only on Xenadu and potentially we scale to other platforms. Okay. okay. And then a general question to everybody here is that, um, how are you dealing with contextualizing your quantum results? Do you feel that outputting PDBs similar file types is good enough? Or do you think that more precise data is needed to, to make use of the tools? I can answer that. Um, I think it's much more, it, it requires more information than a simple PDB. Um, of course, you need to know the, uh, the structure, you need to know the geometry, but you need to know a set of other properties um, because just the molecule itself is probably not enough. Um, and so we include the whole data structure, not just um, the PDB itself. Okay. Yeah, sure. Building on that, I mean, we, we use everything that's available and then some more. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you can possibly find that might tell you more about the molecule you'll use. Yeah. yeah. Understood. So let's see, how are we doing on time? We have a few more minutes and I, I do have a few questions in general here that I, um, let me pick one. Okay. Um, so th th I think this is a um, uh, pick one, Dave. Come on, make up your mind. <laughs> so uh, at the very beginning of the process, um, we, we tend to have a, a target that we then go into the drug design process for. Um, I want to talk, if have people comment on the importance of getting that target. 
uh, and understanding its structure and its shape. I know Shahar for the application we've developed. We need to know the structure before we start out. Is that is that the next place we need to look? Is is being able to understand our target better from the beginning? I mean, I, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, I mean, when it comes to target selection, it's just like any drug discovery, right? I mean, if you have a target where the biology is well understood, uh, that's a good use case for any computational method or development for that matter, right? Uh, if you're trying to develop a molecule, uh, the worst thing you want is you, you create a molecule that binds perfectly to, to your target, but then turns on the biology uh, doesn't work, right? Uh, so in terms of the, the targets um, that, we're, that we're looking at is, uh, a bit of a combination of well-validated targets that already, you know, industry has already developed some methods and new targets where the biology is well understood, uh, but industry or, or pharma hasn't quite gotten there yet. Okay. We've had another real question come in, so I don't have to make up one. Um, the major challenge in applying machine learning in pharma is generally the low sample size of experimental data. We just don't have enough labeled data. Um, so the question, if we got to apply quantum machine learning, how do we handle the fact that we still don't have the data? So I think that's probably one for, for, for one of the machine learning, uh, quantum machine learning answers. Okay, so I can shortly answer the question. So um, the idea was in the presentation, but it was mostly on machine learning. So yes, we don't really have a lot of labeled data, meaning that we need to use industrial techniques, as I have mentioned from uh, computer vision and others. But if we go to quantum machine learning, basically it allows us to work with quantum models of molecules, theoretically. And in this case, we can actually sample data. We can kind of simulate molecules in some way. And that allows us to sample more data, which is kind of enough to work with it. Okay, so actually try and use um, computed, computed d experimental data because we have the power to do it with a quantum device. That would well, then yeah. Yeah. As well. <laughs> Go ahead, Frederick. I, I just wanted to add to that. Um, I think it's also making a virtue out of necessity here because uh, one of the things that has, is being explored with the different quantum machine learning approaches is how can you get uh, the same or even better accuracy when you have noisy data, uh, especially when you have small data sets, because we still have this general problem. It's this common misconception. People think quantum computers are these big data machines where you can just efficiently throw in lots of classical data. So I think it's actually a great case of making a real chart of necessity. Um, and as said, there are already papers exploring how for particularly noisy small data sets, you can get improved accuracies with quantum machine learning. Good. So the, um, I guess the, the, we've got time for maybe one more question. I'll, I'll ask my really, my, my, my tricky one. This may be uh, a much more for the theoretical quantum physicists. Um, when we do quantum computers today, we mostly design them around um, quantum particles that have a binary behavior. They're either zero or one once the waveform collapses. But many of the quantum particles have um, the possibility to, to collapse into many, many, many millions of different states. If we could build quantum computers out of that kind of a device, we would have something more akin to an analog computer. Is that something that would be very useful to us in modeling chemistry as being a very analog business anyway in the first place? Anybody want to approach that question? Well, I can try to do that because what you say is actually somehow connected with Xenadu computer. They're working with photonic one and they're actually working with continuous variables. And primarily it's based on, uh, well, I think it's wavelengths here. And mm -hmm. basically the most kind of reasonable applications are based on graphs. Some of them are based on sampling and what they say is it's sufficient for neural networks as our analog computations are very efficient for weights, which are, well, they don't need to be a really precise computations. I think, okay. it will, I think it will depend on the problem that you're asking or just the questions that you're asking and what you're trying to solve. If you want to calculate the ground state of molecules, okay, which is again, one of the holy grails of the field of, of quantum computing, then I think using the kind of 
binary almost. Um, computers like we built today is going to be better there. If you want to do optimization problems, then looking for something that can collapse to multiple states may be better there. Okay. okay, folks, I think that comes to our end. Aaron, is there anything you'd like to say to close our session? Yeah, I would like to. Can you hear me? Great. Yes, yes. So I would like to thank everyone. I would like to thank our participants, uh, Frederick, uh, Shachar, Hans, and Nihil, and of course to you, Dave, uh, for hosting this great panel. And looking forward to seeing everyone in our next event. Uh, I will post some uh, lineup for the coming event uh, shortly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good uh, afternoon, evening, or whatever. Bye. 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 Bye.